I love the title Real Life, Real Love. I feel like you both have been very vulnerable, um, you know, with your marriage and sharing with us some things that you guys have been through. In today's world, I feel like the word love is thrown around without like true meaning to it. Um, you know, most people aren't even willing to like go through the fire with someone, let alone, you know, marry them for better or worse. And you guys have done that for 20 plus years. Um, so I do want to start with asking you both um, together. Um, if you had to redefine the word love for the Casey's, how would you redefine the word love? I mean, it's funny that you said that because uh, we talk about that and people always ask like, you know, what's what kept your marriage together or what was it? And we always say love. And that's finding the true definition of love, right? And I think it's easy for somebody to be like, I love you. I love you. But do you really love that person? Or are you just saying it because it's you think it's what it is? And if you think when you think about love, if you really love somebody, do you want to hurt them? You know, do you want to lie to them? Do you want to live a secret life? Do you want to cheat on them? If, if the answer is yes, then you don't really love that person. So when you talk about love for myself, it's it's that feeling of when I first seen gear that I still have now. That feeling of butterflies, that feeling of my, that's my baby. You know, it's that feeling of I want to hug you, I want to grab you, I want to kiss you, I want to hold you. That feeling of making sure I want to protect her and make sure that she's always okay through the good and bad, through, you know, her looking amazing and beautiful. And if she gains 700 pounds, that's still my baby. You know what I mean? 700 though. 700. Oh, okay. 701, we might have to talk. Have 700, we, go, we good. <laughs> you know, so so for myself, it's those feelings and that, and that and those butterflies still in my stomach every time I see her. When I wake up in the morning and open my eyes and look over there, she's dead. I'm like, I still have those butterflies. When she kisses me and she has the morning breath and it's just I, like- uh, Morning breath? Well, she doesn't have morning breath. She what, sm what? Sm what? smells like roses all the what? time. Excuse me? All the time. <laughs> You know, but just having those feelings, it just, that's love to me. And those are, and me just talking about it just makes me smile because I only feel about that about my baby. Um, for me, uh, when I think about how love comes over me, when I look at Rashawn, I don't just look at him as my husband. To me, he's like my brother, my best friend, my father, just He's everything to me. I look at him like he's my blood. And when someone is your blood, there's rarely, if ever, anything that they can do that would put them in a position where you would distance them from your life. When you really love someone, when someone's your blood, it's unconditional. My children could never do anything to make me turn away from them. And what I feel for him is just as significant. Um, for me, love is encompassing. I'm consumed with him. Um, everything that goes on in my life starts and ends with him. He's always the, a notion in any decision that I make, any move that I make. It's a want, a need, a craving for that person. Um, and to sum it up, I couldn't see my life without him. He's a constant. And I've said this to him. And it's one of the few things that I don't quite know how to articulate, but I'll do my best because it's my truth. Sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night or look at him in the morning if I wake up before him and I'll look at him. And it's difficult for me to reconcile the idea that he's a separate person. And I'll say it to myself like, yeah, Rashawn is a separate person. He's his own person. He is an individual. He is not part of you. He is not a limb. And it's, it's the most difficult thing to convey, but I, the oneness that I feel with him is um, for a lot of people unimaginable, but I truly feel as though we're one. I hope we all get to experience something like that and hear someone talk about you know, us that way. I would love to hear that one day. I love that. I know you guys kind of touched on what kept you guys together, but I do kind of want to get into that a little bit more. Um, so you guys have been married 20 plus years. Um, you know, that's a, I know that's a true challenge within itself. Um, you know, the ups and downs. Um, there's a saying that I've been seeing, right? It says like men date the women that they need, you know, while they're struggling. And then when they get to a point of success, they date the woman that they want, you know, for you, you guys have stuck it out through it all. And you know, I that down. Yeah, I'm telling you. And um, I really want to know, how have you both kept like the genuine interest, you know, with each other and also kept that spark going for so long, even though there's so much like temptation out here? I feel like asking, how does the woman that you need still be the same woman that you want? Like, how does how, how do you transition? I think for myself, um, 
I found the woman that I needed and I found the woman that I wanted. Mm, I like that. Uh, if that, if that does it. Um, I was lucky enough, you know, and I met Gia when she transferred to my high school, right? From, she's originally from Brooklyn. She transferred to Queens. We went to the same high school. And what attracted me to her first was her beauty, right? And not only her beauty, she ran track, she had double Ds. And when she would run, I would just see the double Ds bouncing. Like that was, that was my attraction, right? And then when I spoke to her, just her intellect and how smart she was and how caring and, and all that. And it was just everything at once. Um, but, it, you know, at the time I'm 16, she's 15. Like this is, I didn't know what this was. Like, it's not like, there's no manual for love. There's no manual for girlfriend and wife. There's no manual. Um, but I knew she was the one. And I knew she was the one from that point on that I was going to marry. We were going to have two kids, a picket fence, and a dog. That's what I thought. That's Don't what I get the frisbee and a frisbee. You that's, a frisbee. That's what I envisioned. Um, and for me, I was lucky enough to find it all. You know, and she's somebody that does it all. She is. She's smart. She's beautiful. She cooks. She cleans. She rubs my back. She encourages me. She motivates me. Uh, she puts me first. Um, and she does all those things that. It's like, she's perfect. Um, for myself, I wasn't as perfect. I mean, at the end of the day, I was with Sean Casey in the house and DJ Envy in the streets. And, you know, it's like anything else. When success hits you, like you said, it's like you start feeling yourself a little better. You, you start smelling a little different. You start you start acting like your doodle don't stink. Like you start moving a little different. And you got to, sometimes you got to get popped in the back of the head and be like, nope, remember where you came from. And uh, for myself, like I said, gear was all of that for me. So it's nothing else that I want besides that. I want to grow old with her. I want to, you know, you know, me and her old gray hairs and in, in the in the convertible driving down, I don't know, Fifth Avenue or Collins in Miami. You know, I want to be there when, you know, my teeth fall out, her teeth fall out. We got to drink through the same straw. Like I want to be there when, you know, she got to put Ben Gay on my back and I got to rub her legs down because her feet hurt. Like that's the relationship that I want to be. You know what I mean? I want her, you know, it, to the point where, you know, she got to change my diaper and I got to change her diapers. Like that's, what I want. I guess for you, Gia, the same question. Um, what for you has kept the genuine interest and like the spark going? Okay. Um, I'm going to be less breathy about this answer. Okay. Um, <laughs> what I love about Rashawn, well, I love so many things, but part of the things that set him apart is his charisma and his charm and his boyish nature. We have fun together. Like every day is fun. It's constant jokes, constant sarcasm. We play fight, we wrestle. We do all of these things that make me feel like I'm still 22. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. never it's never less that. Like we've never lost our infatuation for each other. Um, deliberately and non-deliberately, but we've found ways to keep our relationship sexy and alluring and um the intimacy intimacy has only grown since the beginning and that's that's a big part because a lot of what lures some men away and i'm referencing your last question to the lady that they want is um things that are sex driven um another woman's physical appeal or another woman's um sexual nature or things that can tend to make other women feel insecure, especially with in today's day of social media and technology. But, and it's true, I mean, the same thing, you know, women with men, sometimes men are insecure about, you know, the same things with other men, you know, like you might be, you might feel some type of way that your woman is attracted some, to someone that you find to be more attractive than you. So with us, we've just kept everything in house all of our needs in-house. I do want to dive a little bit into some of the excerpts that I read from the book. The chapter 100 scars, I wanted to ask about that one. I do want to know, and be, being that you have such a protective nature over Gia and ever since you guys were younger, um, did you ever feel guilty about that situation? Like I should have been there. And um, also Gia, I do want to know, um, did you ever blame Envy like back then about him not being there for you? How did you guys work through that? Well, yes, I did feel guilty. Um, one thing about me, and I think Gia knows, and I think the world knows if they listen to The Breakfast Club, and I don't know if this is a good trait, but sometimes I want revenge, right? And the revenge could be in, in many different ways. It could be physically, it could be, I want you to, I, I have to, I don't say I have to, but I want you to feel some type of pain for what you did. 
Um, and that day, you know, again, I went to the same high school. I would drive her home every day. Uh, that was my girl. I drive her home every day. Uh, one day, my friend said, yo, can you fill in for me at work? Okay, no problem. So I set it up so a friend of mine would take her home. Uh, the friend of mine ran track. So we had a half day that day. So he still had to wait to run his track, to go on a track uh, practice. He didn't want to wait a couple hours. He was like, I'll just take the bus home. She took the bus home, took the bus to Jamaica Avenue. She went to McDonald's to get, you know, like everybody else, the number two meal, which was uh, 324 with tax. And um, some girls were there and they were joking her because she was light-skinned, calling her names, Casper, you bleach bitch, and all these other names. Um, and, you know, it got into an argument. Uh, it was like, I think like six on two. And I'll let you tell the story from here. And to answer your question, yes, I did feel guilty. And the reason I feel guilty because I wasn't there. Um, and... I never talk about the story. I never even like, even during the part of the book, that's the only part of the book I didn't read because I don't like to relive it. Gia can talk about it all day long because I always feel like I should have been there. But you can tell from, from McDonald's. Well, it's a very long story, so I'll make it very short. But um, when I walked into the McDonald's, like Rashawn said, um, there was a group of five girls and two boys that were sitting there. And as soon as I walked in, it was the racial epithets and uh, insults regarding my complexion, et cetera. And an argument ensued. We were all kicked out by McDonald's security and people in the restaurant were just livid that I was being kicked out along with the group. It was a disturbance, they kicked everyone out. Once we got outside, the police were called, the police forced us to go our separate ways. I was grateful. Um, once I went my separate way and the police disappeared, they circled back and followed us. And um, you can read it in great detail in the book, but long story short, I was attacked and uh, my face was slashed twice with a razor blade and my inner thigh, my inner right thigh was also slashed with a razor blade. So I have about maybe 70 stitches in my face and about another 70 on my thigh. Um, the girls were subsequently apprehended. The one that cut me went to trial and she served five to 15. The other four were all caught. They all served um, community service and were put on probation. And it was, um, there's so much to be said. There's so much to unpack there, um, but we don't have the time to do it here. But if you read the book, you'll see, like I said, it's explained in great detail. And um, I take the readers through how every moment felt from the moment that it happened um, until now. And, and we, even put, we even put the picture in the book, which really got the girl, I would say, convicted um, because, you know, when you're in court, gear was all, you know, by the time it, By the time it went to trial, two years had already passed. Wow. So I was already healed. So my scar looked similar to what it looks like now. Um, but it had slightly keloided at that point. So it was a little worse than what it looks like now. So if I'm sitting in that witness booth and you're witnessing me tell you about this horrible day that I experienced, it's hard to envision if you weren't there and if you didn't see what it looked like that day. So I was adamant about seeing my face cut open before they stitched me up and they didn't wanna allow me to do that. But I found a way to get to a bathroom when no one was looking and I turned on the lights and I saw my face for myself. Wow. And um, it was the first and the last time that I cried regarding what had happened that day. And um, I sucked everything back up and I went back into the room. I was with my best friend and um, we used to carry cameras in our backpacks every day because we would go to school and take pictures of each other in the cafeteria, us with all our girls and us doing whatever we were doing before, during and after school. So I had a camera in my backpack and before they stitched me up, I asked her to take a picture. And um, in that picture, if you read the book, you'll see you know, my face is just battered and bruised. My face is slit wide open. It, it's a gory picture. You have to prepare yourself to see it. We intentionally put it in black and white instead of in color because it hit less aggressively in black and white. Um, but it takes you through what actually happened that day. Because if you see me now, you, you can't really imagine unless you know someone that's been slashed. I'm very sorry that happened to you. Like I couldn't even imagine something like that that's very traumatic and for you to be able to get through that and you know have not have like animosity against like a certain group of women just because of why they attacked you I think that's 
amazing. For the record, I am a black woman. Um, some people, they don't understand my ethnicity, but my mother is black, white, and Chinese. My father is Puerto Rican. And my mother was born and raised in Jamaica and came to this country and made a life for herself. So the most significant part of my heritage is Jamaican, which is why my favorite music is dance hall and, you know, and whatnot. Um, but people don't necessarily understand that sometimes when they see me. So I don't know that those girls understood that that day, but I would never hold a group of people responsible for the actions of a few. Yeah, when you were younger around that time when it happened, did you ever blame Envy for that? Like, did you ever feel like he wasn't there for me in that situation? Absolutely not. That's great. Absolutely not. It would be completely foolish and unreasonable to harbor any type of animosity for someone that wasn't able to be there on a day for you when they had been there every other day. It had nothing to do with him. He didn't put the razor blade in anyone's hand. So no, I was more so um, comforted after the fact when he came and he let me know that he thought that I was more beautiful that day than the day that he met me. And now, mind you, only about two months had passed. We had only been in a relationship. We were only, quote unquote, going together for about two months. You know, we started our relationship in September. This happened in November, the day before Thanksgiving, which is why we had a half day, because we were let out early for Thanksgiving recess. So yeah, we were only together for two months and he had no idea how my face was going to heal. He had no idea what I was going to look like, but he was right there by my side, supporting me, walking through Green Acres Mall in Queens with a girl with a huge white patch on her face. You know, days later, you know, he, he was my rock and he let me know that nothing would change because of that. I do want to talk about another chapter, when to protect and provide. Um, now, Emmy, this is more so about you. You talked about being controlling versus protective and what that means. Um, I think early on, you would agree that, you know, you were a little more controlling, you know, of what you wanted Gia to do and not to do. I know there's a situation in the book where you talk about you were going to DJ and she said she was going to stay home and she did not She ended up going to the armory and you found out. And when you got there, you know, I guess all hell broke loose. Since you have become more famous and, you know, well-respected of a DJ, Gia, have you ever felt yourself trying to like control him now? Being that, you know, he's gotten more famous. Have you ever been in that position where you felt like now I'm trying to control what he's doing? Has the roles ever reversed? Absolutely not. That's not part of my personality. I'm from the school of thought that if you have a bird and it's meant to stay, you can let that cage door open. And if that bird wants to stay, it will stay. So I would never um, personally try to control another human being. Well, unless they're my children, um, but he is not my child. He is a full fledged grown adult capable of making his own decisions. So when you give people that freedom, you get to see what they're really made of. And in that chapter um, too, Envy, you talked about the reason why you felt like you had to be more controlling is because of your fear of losing something so good. Um, you also talked about like some of your insecurities and why, you know, you were that way. How did you kind of work through those insecurities um, to be, you know, get to a point where you feel secure that like, I know Gia's here for me and she's not, you know, here for what I can do. Like she's here for me. Like, how did you get to that point? Where you didn't, when you felt like you didn't have to be as controlling, but you can be like protective. Yeah, it was never for what I thought, like what I do. I just thought that, uh, I thought I wasn't worthy. Yeah, okay. And I felt like she would find somebody smarter, more handsome, uh, you know, more romantic, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, and that was my fear. Uh, you remember, because growing up, if you read the book, you would see that, you know, coming up, I had glasses, braces, ha acne, I was five foot four. Uh, I always say this, like my mom was like, you know, I, if, if my mom was talking and she was like, I, I wasn't the cat's meow. Like I wasn't that guy. Um, so when I met Gia and she's my everything, I was like, I don't want to lose it. So I would try to be controlling so that she couldn't go out to meet anybody. Um, and I think just having conversations and Gia assuring me that she wasn't, she was here for me. She wasn't looking for anybody else. She was happy. She, I was her everything. I was her baby. I was her, you know, knight in shining armor. I was everything. And it made me feel more comfortable and realize that I was. 
but I was going through my own personal problems because I was insecure and I had to realize I had to get out of that. And once I got out of that, I was no longer controlling. Now Gia, Gia does whatever she wants. She wants to go out. Okay, baby, I'll see you later. Come on, give me a kiss. All right, call me when you get there. Like it's that now. But before that, I was so nervous of she'll go out there and meet, you know, I don't know, whoever. And, you know, and there goes my baby. You know what I mean? So I was definitely insecure and very, very controlling. But I got over that just by having conversations and have real talks about my purpose and our purpose and the fact that I was worthy. You guys are very open about like, past situations that you've had past infidelities things like that and i do want to say that it's very commendable how you two have handled that um how you've allowed each other to heal from that do you guys ever have those moments still where like somebody slides in one of your dms and you're just like you're looking at each other like the audacity of this person do you guys ever deal with that no nah, we don't yeah, no no nah, we don't do that well I, mean, well I will say this what most people don't know is is most of the time when you see a post on instagram it's usually gear posting for me because i'm usually traveling them driving like babe i post this i forgot and then go, when you see the spelling wrong, it's me. When the spelling is right, it's definitely her. But we don't look at that. We don't care about that. That stuff, that, that, that doesn't bother us. We don't even think about that stuff. Yeah, we have what we call it. Well, what he calls a phone up relationship, which means that everything, and it's not just about the phone. It could be the laptop, the email, whatever. Everything about your partner is accessible to you. Because if not, it indicates that there's something to hide. So yes, we are in, I, I comment back to people that might comment to him in his comment section on Instagram. I am all in his Instagram, he's all in mine. We answer each other's emails, read each other's emails. There's no platform for us to hide. And it's just in the spirit of openness. Right, absolutely, I love the other, that. The oh. other day, which was so funny is um, she commented uh, to a friend of hers with a kissy face. Oh yeah. But she forgot to log out of my Instagram. Yeah. So it was me that left the kissy face. Yeah. So we had to call him and be like, look, I wasn't trying to holler at your wife, bro. <laughs> <laughs> that was my wife. He was like, no, nah, no, nah, I figured that. I was like, no, nah, I'm for real. That wasn't me. Yes, but, but yes. you know what? Yeah. And I, all too often, I forget to log out of his Instagram and I'm in it and I'm commenting on other people's pages, not realizing I'm commenting as TJ. <laughs> Being that someone might not know that like it's Gia that's on Envy's uh, Instagram. Like, do you ever see crazy messages and you're just like, are you serious? Like, do you ever see those kind of things? No, nah, but if I do, I show up. We laugh about it. We joke about it. Yeah. On occasion when it happens, like I've gotten a few bleep pics before, like I'll show him. <laughs> not that he wants to see it, but I think it's pretty funny, you know, because like everybody knows you can't follow either one of us on social media and not know that we're together or Correct. not know the seriousness or the level of our relationship. So it's kind of laughable when someone approaches either of us. You both share six beautiful children, um, ranging, uh, ranging from ages of infancy, you just have one, and then young adult. Early on, you know, Envy, you talked about being controlling and things like that. Um, even Gia, you talk about, you know, after you experience what you experience at McDonald's, like you hope your children never have to go through something like that. I do want to know, has any of both of your traits um, kind of trickled down to how you raise your children? How do you kind of make sure that you're not being too controlling, but more so protective of them? I am too controlling. <laughs> I'm not going to sit here and lie. My daughter's 20 years old. She lives uh, the bad thing about her is she lives in Manhattan. So it's not like it's a college campus. She's in the city. So I'm very controlling. I, I got an app on her phone that I can see where she's at. She can also see where I'm at. I don't care. Um, but wait, the, the interesting part of that is that she initiated that form of control. She's the one that told us about the app and downloaded it on both of our phones because she wanted us to know where she was at all times. Absolutely. I have a key to her apartment. I have a key to her elevator. Uh, she FaceTimes us about 30 times. Yes, I want to know. I want to know where you're going. If you're going to a restaurant, if you're going to a club, I don't need to know who you're going with, but just text me. Hey, dad, I'm going here. Hey, dad, I'm, I'm back. Hey, dad, I'm back in my apartment. Hey, dad, I'm going to class. I just feel more comfortable. Same thing with my son. I have a, a, a well, I guess it's a tracker. It's a device. It's a device, a tracker on his car. When he drives, I can see where he's going. I can see how fast he's going. <laughs> I can see how aggressive he is. He's wearing a seatbelt. I can see if he's wearing a seatbelt. I can see all that. But just because I want to make sure he's okay. You know, I gave my son, uh, well, we gave our son for his birthday, a, a very powerful car. Um, and, you know, it's a car that adults don't necessarily can control because sometimes adults can feel themselves and they can drive fast. So I told him with this car is a lot of respect. And, uh, you know, it, it requires a lot of uh, using your head and being smart about it. And he's been, he's been great. And that's with all our kids. And even with our kids, nobody watches our kids unless it's my mother, my father, 
uh, Auntie Will or my assistant Bems. Other than that, no, it's not happening. That's just who we are and how we are. We're really, really close. We're extraordinarily close with our children mm -hmm. and we always have been, especially me, because I'm the one that my kids will tell 100% of everything to. They might filter out a few things for their dad, but my son is 18 and he's still in high school. And every day when he comes home from school and I'm in my room, he'll wander into my room, lay down at the foot of my bed and be like, hey mom. And I know that hey mom just means we just about to have a conversation. So we have a conversation about his day, about kids in his school, about football, about him working out, about girls, about everything every single day. And he calls me about five times a day, but not for any particular reason, just on some old what's up, you know, and I'll tell him what's up. He'll tell me what's up. And then we have a conversation from there. And my daughter, who, like Rashawn just mentioned, has her own apartment. She lives in New York City. She probably FaceTimes me, I would say maybe seven times a day when she wakes up in the morning when she's on her way to class, when she gets to class, when she's on her way back home from class, and then later on to kind of sum up her day and mm -hmm. tell me everything that's going on. She calls for advice and she doesn't even care if we're really having a full-fledged full -fledged conversation. I could be in the bathroom putting on my makeup. She could be in the bathroom putting on hers and nothing even has to be said. We'll just be sitting there putting on our makeup together. And <laughs> it's like, she just doesn't want to get off the phone. And it's just a beautiful relationship that we have with our kids because we deliberately and intentionally created it. So as one third of the Breakfast Club and, uh, you know, which I do listen to religiously every single morning on my way to work. And also you guys are a part of the Casey Crew podcast. How has it been mentally and emotionally just, you know, being like an outlet to your listeners all over the world? I know sometimes you like visit, revisit things that are kind of painful to talk about. How have you uh, dealt with that? I guess just being an outlet to people you don't know. Oh, for myself, it's therapeutic. I mean, you know, what I realized, what what Miss Jones told me when I did uh morning show, the morning show at Hot 97, is as long as you're open and honest, people will connect. And that's what it's been. Um, no matter what I'm going through, I'm open, I'm honest about it, because there's somebody going through the same thing, you know? Um, there's somebody that's going through the, the, the same problems, the same feelings, the same situations. And a lot of times it's, it's a sounding board for myself where it's like, this is what it is. You do gotta be careful on certain things because, you know, I ain't gonna lie, Black Twitter cancel you in a second, but, uh, as long as you're being honest, there's really nothing nobody can say. They can be mad for a little bit, but you know how people get over it. But for myself, it's just a sounding board and I could just be open. And there's so many people that relate to me. And so many people that come up to me and be like, yo, I'm glad you said that because I felt the same way. Or, I'm glad you said that because I'm going through the same thing. So for myself, you know, I enjoyed it. It's, it's my therapy. Um, for me, it's very powerful um, to be able to be in a position where you can kind of orchestrate a sense of community with the people that you are um, inadvertently speaking to, uh, to let them know that what they may have experienced and how they may be feeling is normal. You know, so many of us are so preoccupied with image that, you know, we only put out what we want people to perceive of us. We control our image, but Rashawn and I don't have any interest in image because there's no real value in image. There's no real relatability in image. Sometimes there's no honesty and transparency in image. There's only honesty and transparency in vulnerability. And when you're offering yourself up as a real person who goes through real things. So that's the value in our podcast. That's the value in our book. It's just being able to give people a tangible reference point where they can see life through our lens and be able to turn those pages or listen to those words and say, wow, I felt the same way, or damn, I needed to hear that, or I needed for someone to put it in perspective for me on paper. As a matter of fact, let me go grab my highlighter. I need to highlight some things in this book because I need to be able to go back and remind myself of some things. Um, it's that sense of community that's so important to me and makes us want to do it. You guys have touched on so many touchy subjects um, in Real Life, Real Love. I just looked at like the chapter names and I can just tell. Um, what is one thing that you both agreed shouldn't be talked about in this book and maybe, you know, save for the next book? There was only one thing. What was that? Do you remember? You don't remember? We spoke about it anyway. No, we didn't. We, we had to take about... it out. So there was a section of the book that we wrote 
and for legal reasons, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. we had to take it out. Um, and I'll just suffice it to say that it was an incident that Rashawn went through where he was robbed. We talked about it a little bit, but book. Yeah, I was robbed. Did we talk about yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit of book. Yeah, we talked. I was robbed in, in New York City at gunpoint. And um, I chased the person as they robbed me and caught him. Um, and let's just say the person just happened to be in a coma. And let's just say that my attorney said it wouldn't be smart to explain anything else, but he was in a coma. He was caught and he did uh, some time. I think he did what, seven or eight years? Eight years. Yeah, seven or eight years. Yeah. yeah, but that was the only thing. Everything else we spoke, it was, it was open. Yeah, yeah there we, was nothing. Just like on our podcast, there's nothing that is ever taken off the table. There's mm -hmm. nothing that we won't talk about. Absolutely. If you had to pick maybe like two or three things that you really want people to take away from reading this, what would you say? I want the book. Um, to strengthen people's relationships mm -hmm. with their God, whomever they call God. And if they don't have a God within themselves or whatever it is within themselves that serves as their moral compass. Um, I want people to be able to examine what love means to them. I want people to examine what forgiveness means to them. And I want for people to uh, consider grace. And the last thing that I would say is that I want people to walk away from the book empowered. I want it to encourage empowerment. I want uh, women to be empowered to stand their ground, to learn themselves and to understand what they deserve and their worth. And I want men to be empowered to uh, be accountable and to understand that um, there's power in apology and acceptance of wrongdoings. And I said men and women, but both of those roles can also be reversed because as a woman, I know that there are many women out there that are just as capable of wrongdoing as men are. So for both sexes, I want for them to be able to take away that from the book, uh, de determine based upon you know what position they are in the relationship. For myself, I just want people to know everything that she said and also that uh, relationships aren't perfect. From the book, you understand that, you know, nothing is perfect. You know, everybody posts their relationship online and you see the good parts, but they have to get to a point where people have to be real and understand that, you know, when you read this book, it's not all about, you know, I love you, you love me back, kiss me, kiss you, kiss me, hug me, hug me, let's make sex, let's make love. It's not that. It's like, no, we went through bullshit to get to this point. And hopefully people uh, read this and understand and see what has to be required to have a strong relationship. Because it's not just about we telling you what to do. We guide you and show you how I messed up, what I did right, what she did wrong, what an apology means, what a right fighter is. Because I was a right fighter. I was that person that I didn't understand necessarily understand team. I understand. I just wanted to win an argument. So if me and you are arguing right now and you're like, Envy, that jacket you have is black. I'm like, no, it's red. And I'm going to be like, God came down and told me it's red just to win an argument. And that's not where it should be. Um, and it's just a creation of team. Just in your relationship, you have to have a team. And I want people to just enjoy and hopefully learn some things that uh, we went through that will help their relationship and hopefully don't do some of the things that I did to hurt their relationship. And do some of the things that we did do that led us down the road of having a wonderful relationship, a loving relationship. I want people to be able to read the book and understand that despite the pitfalls, despite the problems that you may stand to go through, if you go about it the right way and if you come from a genuine, real human place, you are able to bounce back. But there are steps that have to be taken and we list those steps in the book. Absolutely. Thank you guys.